Oops. Okay, I think it's it's uh, fine now. Oops. I think it's fine. Okay, now. I think it's it's uh, fine. Okay. So uh, we can start. The purpose of this lesson is to talk about polymorphism, and uh, it's a separate lesson, separate from. Uh, inheritance interfaces and uh, OP as a whole because it's a really important thing for object-oriented programming as a whole it's it's really important and it needs a lot of attention to cover this whole topic and today I will try to explain what is polymorphism how is it used types of it and how is it implemented in C-sharp and what good comes from it. So here goes. So what is polymorphism? Uh, polymorphism is one of the pillars of object-oriented programming. It's essentially an ability for different types to be treated as one. For example, if you have a uh, Volkswagen, BMW, Mercedes, they're all cars essentially. And then you can go beyond and have a ship, have a bicycle, have a car, and they're all vehicles essentially. Uh, and it might sound as a hierarchy of inheritance, but it all simply comes down to the same things being treated as one as a single same type. So you can put all of those that I just mentioned in the single array or list or other collection of cars and then use them in a unified single interface. All right, so, so that's the first type of uh, polymorphism. Other type of polymorphism is when you have a polymorphic function basically an overloaded function, a function uh, which has same name but different input. About that I'll talk in a moment. So like I said, it's a common interface for calling methods on an object, whether all methods on different types or a single method on same object based on overloaded parameters. So the first type of polymorphism is static polymorphism. Essentially what it means is when you pass a different type to the same method or when you pass different uh, arguments, different amounts of arguments, you will get a different behavior. It will be, uh, it will pick a different uh, implementation based on the input. So the method itself does not get picked uh, uh, at runtime, but it's more like static because uh, you don't have to run your program to know which method will be called. You know it based on the input. So for methods which have the same name but different types of input or different count of parameters, uh, they can behave differently. So in this case we have, we see a picture where we have a class granny and it has a single method but with two variants basically. Uh, ask grandchild question so it can either take input as a woman and input as a man and based on that it will based on the picture ask uh, how school and work if you pass man and are you pregnant yet if it's a woman dynamic polymorphism is 
what I call real polymorphism, because um, it is done in runtime and through it you can do many beautiful things. So it is for objects. Object as a whole now is polymorphic as opposed to static polymorphism where function is polymorphic. Here we have an object that is polymorphic. So it includes all the functions that the object has. So it has to derive from the same base type or implement the same interface. And all the magic happens during runtime. So if you mess something, you will not see it until you run your program. And polymorphism creates an is a relation. So, um, in this example, we see a teacher interface and student interface. Teacher can teach uh, and student can study. A good teacher learns and teaches at the same time. So a good teacher needs to be a combination of both teacher and student. Thus, he implements both interfaces. A good teacher is both I student and I teacher. A good, um, a, a lazy teacher is just a teacher. He just teaches and is not willing to learn. And like this, you can combine, you can have, let's say a school. And in that school, you can have a bunch of teachers, I teachers in the same list of teachers, for example, and or a classroom where you have I teacher and uh, a list of students. Students can be high school students, students can be university students, students can be kindergarten uh, children and so on and so forth. Down below you see uh, an illustration of polymorphism where basically uh, a human can transform into different uh, humanoid-like, mostly humanoid-like uh, creatures. Uh, what unifies all those creatures is that they have ability to move, ability to do combat. Uh, so uh, Ben 10 could be generalized as I movable and I... Uh, combatant uh, interface and all those forms could derive from it as well. Uh, and also I transformable uh, because Ben 10 can transform into any of those forms and they can transform back into him. So that is, uh, that is polymorphism. We have an abstraction of a teacher in this case and uh, implementation of a teacher. Abstraction of a teacher can be treated as one. Sorry, all implementations of teacher can be treated as one because there is a single unifying abstraction, which lets us have an is a relation. So polymorphism is abstraction. We get something specific which we can generalize. Something specific is implementation and generalization is an interface or a base class. Inheritance and implementation of interface is abstraction. So I hope you all get this into your heart because polymorphism is essence, essence of object-oriented programming. Essence, because we don't want to be bound to details of implementation. We want to have a black box of something that needs to be done. We say, we see the things we need, we call them, and the result we expect should depend purely on the name. A function should not lie what it does and does by, call, by being called it should do what is expected. So what are the benefits of polymorphism? Well, 
First of all, you have ability to treat different objects as, as one. So here in the teacher's case, we had a teacher who can teach, a lazy teacher can teach, uh, and, and a good teacher can teach. Uh, they are teachers in the end. And they are teachers because they both implement iTeacher interface. In this case, we have fruits, bananas, pears, apples, and so on. They're all edible, so they can all be eaten. Thus, they all need to have a method get eaten. Maybe they will give energy after being eaten. I don't know, and I don't really care. The point is that they can all be treated as one through a unified interface. So in this case, we, well, in all cases of polymorphism, we hide the details and we don't care. And it depends either on type, if it's dynamic polymorphism or input, if it's static polymorphism. So. <clears throat> the benefit of polymorphism is abstraction. It's hiding the details that we don't need to know about. All we need to know is what it does in a nutshell, in a black box. We shove it some input, we get some output, or we get something done. That's all we should care about. Especially when consuming APIs and using third-party libraries. We should know what it's done without knowing how it's done. All right. And, uh, and like this, we can have multiple implementations of the same. For example, if you have uh, a good teacher and a bad teacher, a good teacher comes to lesson and he just says, he says, hey class, how are you? He asks about each student, he cares about them, he doesn't differentiate students. A bad teacher just comes to lesson, gives lesson and leaves. Nothing in between, nothing else is needed. And that's the difference. So like this, many implementations are possible at will, whenever you want. It's a really neat feature and it's a key thing of object-oriented programming. Um, also, very often it happens that, uh, uh, that currently you might not need uh, an implementation, but later on you might. So when there, there is that possibility, uh, you should always uh, expose your classes which contain behavior through an interface so that someone later on can extend the behavior. Exception would be when your class is internal, meaning that it's inside an assembly, it's not exposed as public. And for that reason, it doesn't matter when you write an interface. But when, when you do need multiple implementations, you will write an interface. Uh, another benefit that I didn't mention, polymorphism is at one of the ways how you can uh, get uh, clean code uh, done. For example, when you have multiple uh, inter uh, if statements for some condition, and uh, the condition is based on, let's say, some enum, for example, if you have a norm for an order type, and if a norm of an order type is purchase, you do this. If it's sales, you do this. If it's uh, a quotation, you do that. So you have three if statements, but you can unify them in a single if statement if... Uh, Instead of an enumeration, you instead of an enum, you have a, a, a type, a class, and a type. And uh, for each enum value, you make a, a class. They all derive from order, and each order now 
uh, gets treated differently through polymorphism. So you have sales order instead of just order, you have purchase order, and you have uh, um, quotation. Uh, option B is to have an interface, either parent class or an interface. More recommended is to have an interface because like that, then you don't get bound to the details of a parent. Okay, let's continue. So polymorphism is cool and all, but uh, and there's a question, is this for beginners? Uh, I would say yes and no. For now, uh, up till this, this moment, it's still for beginners. Uh, the last few slides are not so for beginners because it contains uh, uh, a bit of a complex topic, but this is definitely a beginner right now, beginner level, what, what I'm talking right now. So you, you can stay, stick with me, bear with me. <laughs> so <clears throat> this principle sounds really really intimidating. It's called Liskov substitution principle. And you might think to yourself, what the hell is Liskov substitution principle? So what this principle means is that the parent class should be completely replaced by its, oh, <coughs> a child class. Sorry, I made a mistake. A child class should be completely replaced by its parent class. So in this example, you see a rubber duck and an actual duck. Rubber duck doesn't really swim by itself, it just floats. It's not alive, it cannot eat, it cannot breathe. So you might think that rubber duck is a duck, but it's not. So the principle, Liskov's substitution principle gets violated there. Because uh, if rubber duck inherits duck, it doesn't do the stuff that Doug does. And you start hacking your child just to um, be able to do, just to, just to fit the structure of a duck, of a parent. You don't want that. It's a bad thing to do because later down the line, it will be a mess. You say that a duck, a rubber duck can swim, but it cannot, it just floats. You will say that rubber duck can eat, but when it eats, it does nothing. Maybe it squeaks. You can say that rubber duck breathes, but that's not true, it does nothing. It does nothing at all. And leaving empty or not implemented methods like that is a severe violation of Liskov's substitution principle. So name things what they are, and if they are not what you named them, split them. Split them until they become exactly what their name suggests. So in this case, a duck is something that can breathe, eat, swim. So a duck should probably implement I, I swim interface and rubber duck will too. Rubber duck, uh, and that's all. That's all rubber duck is. Other than that, they'd share nothing in common. Rubber duck's swim is floating and simple duck's swim is, is actually swimming. So uh, Liskov's substitution principle is a part of solid, uh, S-O-L, it's letter L of solid. Uh, one of the principles of, uh, not principles, but uh, practices which enforces uh, clean discipline programming. So up till this day, I thought that generics and polymorphism doesn't really have anything in common, but I thought the same about uh, static uh, polymorphism. When you come to think about it, generics are very similar to static polymorphism because essentially you have functions with different types. Functions with different types. So, or classes. Uh, and those types are specified through 
a generic parameter. That parameter can be with a constraint or not. And uh, so the best example of generic is uh, a generic collection. A list is basically a default choice when you choose to store something of many. I enumerable of t, list of t, dictionary of t and t, um, uh, or any generic class or any generic function. And they are a type of polymorphism because essentially you say that uh, any type with potential constraints can be treated as <clears throat> as one, as the same. So that that defines what polymorphism is. So let's define, give more definition to it. So parametric polymorphism and bounded polymorphism. Parametric polymorphism is uh, simply when you have uh, uh, a class or uh, with, with members, with uh, fields or properties uh, or functions where type is specific. You know it. It's an interface or a base class, but it is a parent type. And that's called parametric poly uh, polymorphism. Bounded polymorphism is where you have a generic type and that generic is with a constraint. That's the bound. You, you bound, you constrain your generic parameters. So uh, the difference essentially comes down to when you want a return type, when you want something to be returned and when, when you need to work with the return type specifically explicitly as it is. If you don't, then use parametric polymorphism. If you do, use bounded polymorphism. So, for example, if I have a classroom and I call a teacher, I try to get teacher of that classroom. Uh, based on the requirements, I might need explicitly the type of teacher uh, explicitly the type of teacher uh, that the teacher is, not just teacher, but the type of teacher. And uh, for that case, for that reason, we should use uh, bounded polymorphism. So the first example with classroom TNG is bounded polymorphism and second example is parametric polymorphism. And a type of bounded polymorphism is F-bounded polymorphism. It's a really interesting case where you have uh, a constraint on yourself, where you have um, a generic which constrains itself, its generic T with itself. And the useful case for it would be when you want to clone something. So that's why you need the same type. So in this case, you have iClonable interface and when you clone something, you specify what you clone. By the way, note that we have an out keyword here. Out means that it's uh, a variant, uh, covariant, uh, sorry, that it's covariant uh, um, uh, type, what that means that it's fully, uh, that is fully replaceable by the child, that it will not cause runtime errors. Uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. So in this case, we have a clonable interface and we have an implementation perfect girlfriend, which can clone itself. So when a perfect girlfriend clones itself, it returns a perfect uh, girlfriend. 
And also back to this, if you want more on types of abstraction, I highly recommend reading this Stack Overflow post. The link will be in the description of this video. And last thing I wanted to cover is covariance and contravariance. Uh, so covariance means that child subtype can be fully substituted with parent and contravariance means the opposite, that it cannot be substituted fully. And it means only in those cases where you have an array, collection and delegate, where in other cases not mentioned in the third point, where in other cases you could substitute it, but in, in cases of arrays, collections and delegates, you cannot. So in this example, you see you have an object, array of objects, which gets assigned to itself an array of strings. Well, you might think to yourself, string is an object, but array of strings is not the same as array of objects. And so you have a covariant array conversion from string to object can cause runtime exception. Why you might ask? Because, um, because the string, uh, sorry, because the array uh, of object might initially be an array of strings. And when you create a new array of strings, uh, sorry, array of ints, and when you create a new array of strings, it will probably break. And there is a huge discussion and blog post about this by Eric uh, Lupert, sorry if I said his name wrong, which you can see in the link below. I'll also have it in description. So now I would like to show you the test <clears throat> when this fails. So if I run this test, I use XUnit by the way for testing. So if I run this test now, do this test now, you see that no exception was thrown. So this was good. Okay. What if, what if I create a new array of ints first, then uh, right. <clears throat> um, um, let's try. What if I create new object and run it again? nothing happened, makes sense. Uh, what if I create a new array of, of uh, dummy? I'll create a dummy class. So if I create a new array of dummies, let's see. Hmm. Still no exception was thrown. And this is really, really strange what puzzles me because in MSDN docs it said that it should throw an exception. <coughs> Whoops. So let's let's go on. So I create this and then I say that this is this. Will it still succeed? Still succeeded. Well, I can show you a post on MSDN, which says the other thing. Um, MSDN covariance. Uh, 
an exception here. It says that if I do this, the following produces runtime exception. Oh, if I access array zero is then yes, right. So assignment is fine, but uh, since this is essentially anything, but by saying this, I restrict the type to being uh, uh, specifically dummies. So if I do uh, this, that the first element is uh, one, I'll get a runtime exception. As you can see here, okay. <clears throat> so never ever do bullshit like this and be really careful about having contra uh, uh, contravariance or uh, covariance uh, in your code. This is contravariance or covariance. All right. And uh, uh, example of uh, generics and polymorphism uh, via uh, inheritance, uh, via interfaces, I'll, I'll give an example. So let's say we have a class, um, a teacher, uh, yeah, teacher class. Then we have lazy teacher. Uh, I'll give the type for teacher uh, after the name. All right. Uh, first, let's do implementation with uh, enum, with the case where I said the polymorphism uh, solves this problem. So you have type uh, attitude, teacher attitude. lazy and good. So our teacher will have teacher attitude. And it will not change once the teacher is made, we'll have some attitude. Uh, teacher will also have a name. age and uh, of course not 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 uh, a string so name age and subject subject uh, the teacher teaches or actually uh, subjects that it teaches Subjects and let's create a type of subject. It will just have a name so far. create a teacher, I pass in a name and uh, attitude, uh, attitude, teacher attitude and 
a array of subjects that I will put in read-only list. So when uh, when so I set the things that I edit name is name age is age didn't put age yet All right and uh, subjects. Range uh, subjects cast to subject to list. I don't need to list. I enumerable subject add range. I enumerable subject. Uh, right. Uh, I create a new list and then I add subjects to it. I cannot add subjects to it. Uh, uh, okay. I will simply Subjects list is um, collection. Okay, and then I simply say subjects is actually right away. I say that <laughs> that's that's all. list actually right just subjects to list <laughs> what am I doing okay so we have a list of subjects read only uh, subject that's the teacher that's our teacher we could say that uh, public string description get this is really a simple class so small small immutable and simple no behavior all the buzzwords for struct so let's convert that to struct And name is name, description is description, right? And now what we can do is, let's say our teacher knows a single subject. No more multiple subjects, but the single subject. And we want to get a specific subject that it knows. Well, never mind that. Uh, if if it was a class, it would make sense. But this is not the case. So never mind that. Okay, let's continue. Uh, we have a teacher who has an attitude, who has subjects, and we have a classroom. which has uh, a, sub a subject for which it, uh, it exists. And uh, what else do we have? Uh, we have students and teacher.
and students. Uh, this will be I enumerable. Okay, and classroom student and student is some class that I need to make. I'm not modeling a complex system, so I will use inheritance to reuse uh, some properties that a student and a teacher has. They're both humans. Though the principle of preferred composition over inheritance uh, should still apply. My set now will have to be implemented as I'm doing a set in a child. So it will have to be a protected set as I want to have the property for setting in the child class. And my human will be abstract class. And my properties will also be abstract properties now. So this, what I'm doing right now, don't do this ever, as essentially I'm just reusing properties. I'm not achieving polymorphic behavior. I'm just achieving properties, reusing properties. It's not something that great. Preferably, Preferably, human should, teacher should be made of a human and someone who can learn because teacher might be a robot and robot is not a human. And that's why uh, there are those cases where inheritance fucks you up really a lot. And sorry for cursing, I promise not to curse. <laughs> okay. But this is not the point. This is uh, an illustration of how, uh, how polymorphism works. Right. So let's implement the stuff. Why is it private? I have no clue. Okay. Well, essentially, I didn't really achieve anything with this <laughs> as uh, as uh, I still need to rewrite them. I actually lost for something that I wanted. There won't be abstract properties. They'll be just properties. So. I just really hate a class which can exist by itself yet is well and, and to make it not exist by itself, you add abstract keyword but then it has no behavior and no abstract methods. And that is not how an abstract class should be. So this right here is dirty code smell. Okay. So right now we have student is a human, nothing more. Uh, So a good, a good implementation, th this right here is dirty. 
A good, a better implementation is still not good, but a better implementation is when you have constructor of a human in human and using nothing else but that in the child. I mean, not using it in the child too, so that you don't mess the uh, law of the meter, which says that uh, when inheriting something, you should uh, have only additive behavior in the child class. Otherwise, it's considered dirty. So, okay. All we have to do now is to add initializer. Oh, we still need those string. I'll just copy paste from here. Name and age. <coughs> Name and age. Good. Done. Done. Public. Protected. Right. It's protected because uh, I, I can't, I shouldn't be able to create a human by itself. So there is no point to have a public constructor. So I shouldn't even see it as an option. Right, so we have human, teacher is a human, it's a, is a relation, so it's polymorphic, it's polymorphic, let's create more polymorphic things. Uh, so we have classroom, teacher, student, and let's create a constructor. I hate that it did it at the top. <clears throat> uh, uh, what does it say? Uh, classroom subject subject. Right, public and public. Public. <coughs> okay. So now we have a classroom with a teacher, sorry, with a teacher, with a subject with students. Subject is in teacher, so that doesn't really matter and that isn't really needed. All right. Now, what I should do is try to run a simulation for it. Uh, let's say I go to this program. Oh, is this in a test class? It's in a test class. I uh, will move it all to another place. Let's say in core, I will create a new item. I'll call it uh, School simulation. Of course, it should all be in 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 different files. Each class enumeration and en enum in a different file. But okay, whatever. Uh, public, public. So we have a human class. Teacher is a human, we have a subject and a classroom. Okay, so if we run this, for this I'll use params.
right? And let's run it. So let's create a teacher, Thomas Jefferson, who is 25 years old, who has a good attitude. Who has a single subject. Maps. And pass and maps. Okay. And let's create a bunch of students. Tim Bim fifteen. John Cena <laughs> twenty. Dald teacher students. And let's make classroom do something. Public void uh, ring a bell. What happens? Gather. Teacher, teach. And uh, for each bar student in students, go to lesson. Study. Ah, uh, go to lesson. Ah, uh, study. Study is fine. <coughs> I'll call it study. Uh, I'll, I'll actually... Yeah. Here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. study study classroom <clears throat> so when I ring a bell I begin lesson
I gather students go to lesson. Right, lesson, more like subject, lesson is subject, so that's also fine. Let's implement that method, uh, just created. So students gather, uh, so we ring a bell and we start the lesson. We uh, gather students first and then we can start the lesson. Go to subject lesson. Uh, teacher subject. First, let's say. Uh, of course, error handling, but a teacher is not a teacher if it cannot teach anything. So, one at least, one at least. What does go to do? It will say, uh, Let's get what the description of a student is. So it's name, uh, age, Same for subject. <clears throat> and subject quite quite similar. All I do public override the string. And say name description. And limitation, I say that this. Okay, so each student goes to teacher subject and that's implementation of my lesson. So if I hit run now, nothing will probably happen uh, because I need to say ring a bell. If I ring a bell, I write teach is not implemented. Let's implement it. Teacher, human, human will have, right. So I can move the, the string here. And I can say, um, that this guy is teaching. Okay, so if I hit run, I 
can uh, let me pause it. So if I hit run now, you can see that this guy is going to maths, calculus, he's going to maths, calculus, and is teaching maths, calculus. Um, let's say that our, so we, we will teach based on attitude, right? Uh, that's the intention. So if so now let's do something stupid in the teach method. Uh, where's the teach? In the teach method, we say if attitude is good. He does that. Else if attitude is lazy. He is snoring. And in this case, he's also um, going around the class and really caring. And he's teaching students. Ignoring students. And this guy goes and says, Good job. Student, keep it up. So now if I run, uh, teach students. Right, let's go back to program and let's create two classrooms. Uh, more like two teachers, so all, all I care is actually two teachers. Teacher bad, teacher good, teacher bad, lazy. Doesn't need to be a bad teacher, just lazy teacher. Well, it's actually a bad teacher, we'll go there, okay. Teacher good. Classroom, teacher, bad, lazy, sorry. <laughs> so this is first, this is second. Ring a bell, let's see what happens. So now you see that Both teachers are snoring. They're not doing a good job. Why are they both snoring? I don't know. If attitude is lazy, snoring. Are they both having lazy attitude? Uh, nope. One has good. Uh, So why is it not doing this ever? 
Oh, right, because I didn't set the attitude. I ignored it. So it defaulted to lazy. So he was snoring. Right. If I hit run. So you see that good teacher is teaching and bad teacher is snoring. But this is ugly. This is implementation for a good teacher and this is for bad teacher. And they are essentially very different things. If statements are bad, I mean, you can do a lot with them, but they are not a go-to thing when you consider different implementations. When you consider different implementations, the first spot should be polymorphism. So let's make it polymorphic. To make it polymorphic, we will move this to another class. And the class name will be good teacher. and lazy teacher. <clears throat> and now, public uh, void each I enumerable student students. This is how they teach and attitude is not, not needed anymore. It's not needed. And here attitude is not needed. And here attitude is not needed as well. And here it's not needed. Here it's not needed. And here it's not needed. Here it's not needed. Here I just say abstract. And here the teacher becomes abstract. And the constructor becomes protected. And last but not least, uh, I should implement good teacher, lazy teacher. And actually the other way around. And now we have every factor teacher class. Teach public override. Right. 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 And uh, protect it. Right. So now if I go to my program, I no longer need to pass attitude. All I need to do is to say that this teacher is good. And this one is lazy. And now if I run, I get the same behavior. And, and yeah, um, I can go as much as var people. People are list of human and this list is made of students. So first it's made of 
teacher. Uh, teacher lazy. And of course, students. So, uh, so P as a person and P, what I want to do is to print out every person. Uh, more like like this like this and I'll say CV start <laughs> and if I hit run, I see polymorphic behavior here, actually uh, here and here. Good teacher inspires other students and a bad one or a lazy one snores, snores during lessons. Each, a te each teacher is a human. Every teacher is a human. Every student is a human. They're all humans. And thus I can treat them as one and loop through all of them. Having uh, a behavior like this. Printing their properties in a loop. Treating them all as people. Lastly, what we did in this lesson was run a unit test uh, for covariance and what we noticed uh, where's the test where is my test well what we noticed basically is that if i run this Right, my dummy is gone. So if I run this, you see that we get a runtime exception. And if I run this, you see that there was no exception. And this is all about covariance and variance, where uh, Variance is when you have types uh, completely substitutable with one another, like in here. Uh, <clears throat> like in here, uh, so everything works, uh, we, we can write the test actually here. So let's make one more test, a few more tests. Public void uh, covariance should succeed. Test. And if I do this, and if I say, test. And if I try to get uh, 
uh, objects. Uh, add uh, it will be I list then Because list, uh, not sure. Object string uh, object dummy string object okay. Eh, not sure. Anyways, this is contravariance and this will cause runtime exception. So be careful about it and just, just be aware that stuff like that might happen. It's a more rare case and you should be aware. Polymorphism is great. It's one of the pillars of OP. Use it, prefer it, pitch it, worship it. It's the best. Thank you for watching me and bye-bye.